Hello and welcome to the Nexus Mountain Network podcast. We are live with Dr. Robert Malone. He is back and joining us. We probably did a show about a year ago and a lot has happened since that time. Uh, we have definitely joined forces together. We wanted to welcome you to the show. And as usual, this is a live show, so you can be a participant with us. So if you want, you can start to make comments, let us know that you're watching. And just think about this. You have an opportunity to ask Dr. Malone a question, and we will be keeping an eye on those questions as well, and uh, we'll include you in the show. So if you want to go ahead and let us know that you're watching, um, I want to give an introduction to Dr. Robert Malone. If you don't know who he is, um, you probably do know for sure. But just in case you don't, um, he recently, not recently, he was on our show before. And one of my favorite things about it is we talked about courage. And we talked about how he stood up. We talked about a little bit about how I stood up to uh, the times that we're in. But my favorite moment is we had an opportunity to pray together. And it was off camera. And I appreciated that so much. And uh, I, I, I really stand by the courage that he's had. Uh, back then, and he continues to have. So let me tell you. So he is the inventor of the mRNA and DNA vaccine technology. He has extensive clinical research studies. Uh, I've been a part of them. And I, I personally know what that means be coming out of the pharmaceutical industry. His medical training was at Northwestern, Harvard, and UC Davis. Uh, he was on many, 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 many shows, but some of the more popular ones, Joe Rogan, uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, Candace Owens. And guess what? Now the Nexus Mountain Podcast, he can actually add that to his bio. Uh, and he has a sub stack that we want to encourage you to participate in. Uh, he has over 350,000 subscribers. And I, I love what he has to say. Sometimes it's uh, more in depth, sometimes it's short. And the nice thing about sub stack is you can look and see how long it's gonna take. Dr. Robert Malone, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chad. And congratulations on the growing uh, maturity of your platform here. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you chose to accept our invitation. And it means a lot because uh, I've watched what you've done from afar and what you're doing lends courage to others to do the same. And including someone like myself that was in the pharmaceutical industry and said, enough is enough. This isn't right. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I'm, a, I'm going all the way to the top and I'm going to plant my flag on this mountain and say, no, I'm going to stand up for those who can't. And that's what you're doing too. So um, I want to let you guys know that um, I see a lot of people are already making comments I want to give you a high level overview of some of the topics that we're going to discuss so you can prepare yourself as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the recent events uh, with Dr. Fauci and the select subcommittee uh, regarding the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, I really want to dive into DNA fragmentation uh, to understand what that means. Um, also, we're going to talk about accountability from the government and pharma perspective. What happens if 3.2 million illegal aliens cross our border? I'll ask Dr. Malone about that as well. And there's a few other topics. So let's get started. Dr. Malone, I want to ask you about Dr. Fauci. Uh, he was recently questioned for about seven hours in front of the select subcommittee. Um, behind tell us the story, right? Behind, okay, so th this is your, th th I'm going to return, just turn it over to you. Tell us on a high level, what happened and what does this mean? Uh, so uh, Dr. Fauci, so the setup for here is that we have the select uh, committee on the coronavirus crisis, pardon me. Uh, nice chicken dinner today. <laughs> um, uh, so forgive me, uh, select, uh, uh, committee in the house on, uh, coronavirus crisis. And, uh, that committee has half a dozen physicians on it. And it also has folks like, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene on it, mm -hmm. uh, who, who, uh, as you know, is often, um, on the right, uh, out on the edge a little bit, uh, pushing the envelope. Yep. And, uh, she finds that useful. Uh, politically for her with her base in uh, northern Georgia, where I used to live. Uh, so uh, the select committee has been very reluctant to take on anything other than the virus origins story. And uh, so a little more context, uh, MTG is going to hold, they, she's held one uh, independent hearing uh, that I was uh, invited to. And there's another one coming up uh, that Peter McCullough and uh, uh, Ryan Cole will be testifying at. I don't know who the other ones are. And she's doing that largely out of frustration because the select committee won't address the uh, harms associated with the, uh, quote, vaccine products, the mRNA or genetic-based vaccines. 
So the uh, Select Committee on Corona Crisis it has uh, really been diving into the details of the origin of the virus. And uh, with their momentum and efforts and uh, Freedom of Information Act disclosures that have been obtained, as well as the case of Missouri v. Biden, uh, which uh, had to do with uh, a number of complaints having to do with censorship uh, by the federal government, uh, and includes uh, some of the uh, Great Barrington Declaration signatories that were uh, defamed uh, by uh, Fauci and Collins. We know that because of the FOIA uh, emails. Uh, so uh, this, this uh, committee has built quite a body of information and momentum, including the whistleblower disclosure that the CIA held a, a finding uh, committee and that that committee uh, surreptitiously interviewed Dr. Fauci uh, and uh, the committee members were, at least it's asserted, were uh, financially incentivized to come to the conclusion that the CIA wished them to conclude, which was that it was not a laboratory origin. But the preponderance of evidence is now quite strong that uh, this was a uh, engineered virus. The engineering occurred largely in cooperation between the EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, and as um, uh, Bob Redfield testified quite a while ago now under sworn congressional testimony, involved capital you know, funding from USAID, uh, DOD, DITRA, uh, NIH, uh, State Department, et cetera. So it's, it's now come to the point where what's going on in DC is a kind of a scrambling of those that uh, think that they want to be in the next administration, particularly those that would wish to be in a Trump administration, which seems to be kind of the emerging consensus in on the Hill in DC that uh, Trump, if it's Trump v. Biden, it uh, appears pretty clear that Trump is gonna be our next president. That's, a, that's an open question. So in this context where uh, there's kind of a uh, political reorganization going on and a lot of people are uh, busy trying to uh, rehabilitate themselves uh, politically. Uh, Mr. Fauci agreed, he's just to recap, he's now retired. Uh, he has a security detail funded by the likes of you and I to the tune of over a million dollars a year uh, still. So that he has a dedicated driver, etc. I think it's a six person detail. Uh, which is quite substantial. Uh, you know, uh, most House members get maybe one or two, uh, if if necessary, even. So, uh, Mr. Dr. Fauci is uh, quite well endowed in terms of security, and uh, um, there has been an effort on the Hill to take that away, but I think he still has it. And uh, he was put in a position where he was uh, really forced to at least provide. Uh, sworn testimony behind closed doors. And the committee indicates that they anticipate that he'll be available in the future for uh, open public testimony. There has been a transcript uh, of, of the proceedings. I have not seen that transcript made public. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, and for instance, Thomas Massey has uh, interviewed and has transcripts under sworn testimony of Marion Gruber and the other FDA official that resigned. You may, if you're following the bouncing ball carefully here, uh, they were the senior FDA officials that uh, resigned because they wouldn't go along with uh, some of the uh, market authorization or EUA uh, endorsements that, that took place. They, they elected to resign. So not everybody in the government is compromised, let's say, uh, is the point. So there's a, there's a number of these out there. And in the case of Fauci's testimony, all we really have are the disclosures from the select subcommittee, and many of those have been coming out as tweets, uh, and uh, or or I guess we call uh, we call them posts now if we want to follow Elon's uh, new <laughs> picture. Uh, uh, X posts, I guess. X uh, posts, is that what we're calling it? Okay. I okay. guess that he said that we're supposed to call them posts. Uh, and if Elon says it, then we all salute, right? Um, <laughs> well, and, I did tell, by the way, I did tell, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, please. You. Well, I was going to tell the audience. I, I told Doctor Malone before the show that uh, I uh, I was fasting 
uh, well, X for, for the month of January. So I don't call it anything during this month. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, and very good on you and good for mental health for sure. Uh, so, um, uh, what comes out of that is a number and remember like any of these committees, they will release the information that they want to release that benefits their, uh, political agenda. Uh, and so that's not necessarily a full representation or an accurate representation of what transpired. Apparently, Dr. Fauci, as he did in his testimony in uh, Missouri v. Biden, where he had a, a selective memory loss over 100 times, as I recall, did have some problems recalling uh, details and answers to specific questions. But uh, some of the bombshells apparently that were dropped was that Dr. Fauci acknowledged that he does sign off on every single grant contract. Uh, mm -hmm. So he, he provides final signatory authorization uh, that he does not read those. So he cannot be held accountable or he asserts, even though the whole reason for his signature being there is to hold right. you know, somebody to be accountable. Uh, right. he, is, he is positioning himself uh, that, well, he didn't actually read those or he you know, wasn't really aware of that. Uh, in the and the scope and nature, he also disclosed that the NIH has no formal process. Or since we're we're both pharma folk, we can use uh, fancy pharma language like quality control. Uh, so there's no formal uh, QA QC by NIH, let alone NIAID, on these various foreign grants and contracts. And this relates to some other uh, information that had been disclosed having to do with uh, one of the proposals that seems to have been funded by Fauci, but was originally run through Defense Threat Reduction, I'm sorry, uh, uh, DARPA, Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency, in which EcoHealth Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology proposed the a specific fear and cleavage site gain of function research in a uh, Sarbico virus uh, virtually identical to the one that has been engineered. So they, they propose the spe specific changes that uh, are associated with this uh, Wuhan one strain that circulated globally uh, in uh, starting late uh, 2019. Uh, and so uh, we, we have uh, these series of uh, kind of selective disclosures from the committee that uh, indicate that uh, there is clearly a failure of adequate oversight uh, and acknowledgement that uh, these this funding did uh, flow. Uh, there was some apparently some uh, uh, creative language around um, uh, kind of obfuscating or or um, positioning. Uh, uh, this is kind of like tomato, tomato about the gain of function research. Uh, you know, the position that Mr. Fauci is falling back on is basically gain of function research is in the eye of the beholder. And as far as he's concerned, uh, this wasn't gain of function, but that's just no longer really tenable. Uh, and, and according to the official definitions that NIH has used, what, what did transpire was gain of function research. We also know that uh, there was a planning uh, to enable this gain of function research that goes back to 2017 at least, uh, that uh, Mr. Fauci was directly involved in. Uh, he's now claiming uh, kind of selective memory loss about that, but the documentation is quite clear of Xi Jinping Li uh, in, uh, I think, Dazak uh, presenting uh, at uh, meetings at NIH that Fauci attended in which they described all this in detail. Uh, and then subsequently after those meetings, uh, there was a, a concerted effort uh, to enable uh, gain-of-function research uh, um, until uh, Mr. Obama uh, shut it down in theory, but it, it was only shut down in the United States, and they basically offshored all of this. Uh, and the other thing that came out of that uh, disclosures about the DARPA proposal was that uh, uh, what 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 was obtained under FOIA was a earlier draft of uh, that proposal with uh, handwritten notes, as I recall, or or it was email threads, in which uh, 
uh, DASIC and EcoHealth Alliance are interacting with Shijun Li and uh, staff at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, talking about, well, uh, we're not going to put the uh, WIV scientists on this proposal. We're going to put other Chinese scientists that work at uh, UNC. Uh, so this is Barrick's group. Uh, and um, we're going to use BSL-3, but we're going to or BSL-2, but we're going to tell the government that we're going to use BSL-3. So we're basically going to charge the government for BSL-3. This is the higher level biosecurity with hoods, but without the moon suits, the reverse pressure laboratories and that kind of stuff, which is what one should have done. Uh, and and they're, they're saying, well, at, uh, the Chinese scientist thinks, well, we can, we can do this at uh, um, uh, a lower biosafety bio level and save money and time. Uh, but we, we won't disclose that to the NIH because the reviewers might basically blow a gasket uh, because there might be a lab leak. Uh, so, so that's kind of where things are at is, is as before, uh, Fauci seems to be bobbing and weaving a bit uh, yeah. in, in his disclosures, but still some key information is coming out. And we'll yeah. see what more comes out from the committee uh, um, and whether or not that transcript will be released. And then those of us the problem is that even though there's six physicians there, they're not physician scientists. Okay. Uh, and the appearance is that they, uh, or, or an assertion has been made that, as I mentioned, the reason why they don't want to go into the vaccine product is because they don't want to create, quote, vaccine hesitancy. But the, uh, let's say the black pill uh, version of that story is they're all taking uh, money from pharma uh, for their campaigns and they, they don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's really going on. So yeah. I hope that gives you a kind of a snapshot. This is very much an evolving story. Yeah. And uh, just to opinion, so I'm going to switch over to, uh, not that I haven't been sharing opinions, but uh, uh, more hypothesis speculation. The, the What I'm hearing um, bubbling up, uh, reinforced by behaviors of uh, and, and disclosures of uh, People like Francis Collins, who's who's now giving interviews in which he's saying, "Well, we really shouldn't have had public health officials setting uh, policy uh, during the COVID crisis. That was a bad idea." There's there's some kind of historical revisionism and limited hangout stuff. Bob Cadlick also is in the middle of that, uh, as I said, trying to rehabilitate themselves. And and the key issue here is, as as all these data are coming out, this information, somebody is going to have to take the fall and it yeah. can't be the state uh no. the the uh impact politically financially uh um legally uh of of a, a formal acknowledgement that the u.s government uh acting in cooperation with its ostensible uh competitor the ccp uh created this uh that then caused all this damage globally you know compounded by bad public policy uh, uh, has huge implications geopolitically. And so somebody's going to have to take the fall. And uh, it, it's kind of looking like that somebody uh, might be uh, Peter Daszak and uh, Tony Fauci. And we'll see whether uh, Borla, Pfizer, uh, Moderna uh, um, uh, have to take some consequences, uh, even though they've been indemnified. Uh, so, so that's kind of where a lot of this, the arc of, of, of near-term history is going. Uh, and remember that this is all in the context of the 2024 election. Right. And I appreciate that because it leads me to my next question. And I wanted to say thank you to the audience. We're getting a lot of good questions. And so I, so I want to keep going because I want to be able to get to their questions too. But you talked about Moderna and Pfizer being indemnified. Um, I want to talk about DNA fragmentation uh, because this, this was an important topic that came to light. Um, and it's something that you talked about, you've been talking about for months now uh, and more intentionally. Can you tell the audience in layman terms, what is it and why is it important? Okay, so let's, I'm, I'm for some reason, I'm kind of sensitive about making sure that people, credit goes to where credit's due. So uh, Kevin McKernan, uh, uh, David Weissman, uh, Jessica Rose, uh, a number of others, and, and there's been kind of a snowballing of uh, largely genomics labs that have mm -hmm. confirmed the original observations Great. that uh, there are DNA, there is DNA fragment contamination. And again, uh, a, 
with you, I'm allowed, I guess, a certain amount of latitude to use the big words uh, from PharmaLand. Uh, the key question is whether or not it rises to the level of adulteration. Right. And adulteration, uh, uh, we're not talking about uh, something that is forbidden in the Ten Commandments, uh, unless they're the Ten Commandments of Pharma. Well, it may be. <laughs> uh, adulteration is goes back to the original charter of the FDA in, uh, remember, it's Food and Drug Administration. It goes back to the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, the Chicago stockyards and meat industry and the scandals that happened there, and uh, which included uh, rodent feces and other material in the food stream uh, that uh, uh, resulted in such outrage and the original legislation for the FDA. And so basically the rules are in the FDA charter, this is fundamental to what the FDA is supposed to do, is that it is supposed to ensure uh, that a, a drug product is pure, uh, it is potent, uh, it has the, uh, in the authorized activity. Uh, so in the case of the coronavirus vaccines, the licensure is technically for prevention of COVID disease and coronavirus and, and SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, which they absolutely don't do. Uh, that's, I think all of us in our lived experience know that they don't prevent. Right. We can arm wrestle about how much they mitigate a right. disease and death, but yep. uh, I, think, I think the science is settled for most of us based on personal experience that they don't yeah. prevent the infection and they right. don't prevent the disease. Uh, right. So uh, among these things, purity, potency, identity, uh, uh, is adulteration. The presence of potentially toxic contaminants which are not identified on the label. So you can have something that is a right. uh, component or a contaminant of a uh, drug product and a vaccine is a drug product. Uh, and if it's on the label, uh, that means that it's been acknowledged and that functionally you as a consumer, as the uh, physician prescribing or the individual taking, are aware that that uh, contaminant is present. And so then it no longer rises to the level of adulterant. If it is an adulterant, ergo a toxic substance, which is not identified on the label, is the, is the basis uh, of the regulatory guidance, uh, then Technically, it is to be withdrawn from the market, essentially immediately. Uh, yeah. It should be withdrawn from the market voluntarily by the sponsor. Uh, this is, again, regulatory speak. Normally, the sponsor is pharma. It's the uh, manufacturer developer that holds the market authorization, what you might call the license. Uh, and however, in the case of the emergency use authorizations that we have seen deployed here, in a sense, the sponsor is the government, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so Pfizer and Moderna have acted functionally as a contractor to the government. Uh, and really the government holds the portfolio, which means it also holds the responsibility. Good luck suing the government. Uh, and um, so then the normal tension that you have between a, uh, a regulatory agency and a sponsor, you know, FDA and Merck, or choose your yep. company, uh, yep. um, no longer exists. Uh, the fox is guarding the hen house. The, the uh, right. FDA is functioning as, or, or HHS, or HHS DOD. We can argue about what that is and, you know, where the lines are, but the government is the sponsor and it's also the regulator. And clearly that doesn't work very well, especially in the face of indemnification. So getting back to DNA fragments, uh, in order to manufacture uh, these modified uh, messenger ribonucleic acid strands, that's, that's where, you know, cutting through the acronyms, those are the words, uh, or modified mRNA. Why is it modified? Because it, instead of the usual four components, if you think of RNA as a string of pearls, that string of pearls would have, you can think of the pearls having four different colors. And normally they would be the, the nucleotide bases A, U, G, C. Uh, and the Nobel Prize was given for Carrico and Weissman for the 
a discovery that instead of you can substitute instead of you you can substitute a modified molecule pseudouridine and it will suppress the inflammation associated with injecting the mrna so it's immunosuppressive and it will also extend its half-life so these uh, modified messenger rnas last in your body uh, it's well established now multiple papers for at least weeks and probably months very different from natural RNA, which would last in your body for hours. Okay, so that's that. Now, how do you make that string of pearls? How do you make that mRNA? Well, you have to make it from a DNA template. DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, central dogma of biology. Uh, so you have to have DNA to make the RNA. Okay, where are you gonna get the DNA? There was actually, in the case of Pfizer, two different manufacturing processes. The first one done by Aldevron was used PCR to make uh, DNA strands without having to have bacteria as the source of the DNA. They couldn't sustain enough uh, product throughput uh, using that process. And so near the end of the initial clinical trials, they suddenly switched of necessity and switched the contracts over to Lonza uh, and started using a different manufacturing process for the DNA template they used uh, circular DNAs manufactured in bacteria. They're called plasmids. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the way that I had done it originally back in the late 80s. Uh, and so the problem is when you make DNA in a bacteria, you have to pop the bacteria open. And when you do that, it releases a product of the bacterial cell membrane and wall called endotoxin. And you may be familiar with endotoxin. It is uh, the uh, biggest problem uh, in, in injectables. Pretty much sterility and endotoxin are one and two in terms of the, the main manufacturing challenges. Because yeah. endotoxin, humans are super sensitive to endotoxin, and it will cause you to go into what's called endotoxic shock, or shock where you suddenly have a drop in blood pressure, you faint, uh, you can die from it. Uh, so. Uh, endotoxin is a problem. Endotoxin comes from bacteria. And under this new manufacturing process, your uh, uh, Pfizer and Moderna are using bacteria to produce these small circle RNAs or DNAs that are then used to guide as the template, the polymerase that makes the RNA. Then they got a problem. How do you purify the RNA away from the DNA? And the way that's done is you cut, you use a DNAse an RNA-free DNA that cuts the DNA into little fragments. Then mm. you got to purify it. And there aren't too many ways that you can purify it. You can use column chromatography, or you can use uh, continual flow centrifugation. And they opted for the centrifugation, which is less efficient and results in more contamination. So uh, along comes Kevin McKernan, a genomic specialist, uh, and he samples some vials that have already been opened. So the chain of custody is blown up, you know, uh, samples those vials uh, and um, sequences the residual DNA fragments to see if there's any DNA. And if so, what is it? Because none of this was disclosed. Uh, and he finds that, holy moly, there is a, a lot, by his opinion, of these DNA fragments left over from the circular bacterial plasma DNAs. Uh, and then he uses standard genomic software to reassemble what those plasmids look like. And lo and behold, what they've done apparently is taken off the shelf uh, research grade plasmids and use those as the backbone for inserting the spike protein sequence into it uh, with the polymerase promoter. Uh, who cares? Well, those research grade plasmids have sequences in them that drive an antibiotic resistance gene. They actually have an antibiotic resistance gene in them, canamycin. Otherwise, neomycin is also mm. used. Uh, it's driven by a sequence, one of the most potent genetic switches known to man, which is derived from a virus called simian virus 40. The whole simian virus 40 is not in there, just this little fragment uh, of the promoter enhancer. This is a genetic switch together with a nuclear localization sequence, things that bring the DNA into the nucleus. So Kevin finds this and then, uh-oh, you know, I get a call, uh, what does this mean? Uh, we talk about it, um, they do more research, they get some sealed vials with good chain of custody, 
uh, sequence those. They got the same problem. Uh, and then the whole thing blows up. And uh, we have reporters writing to FDA, Health Canada, and European Medicines Agency who uh, saying, you, what's this about this DNA contamination and these DNA fragments? And all three uh, regulatory agencies basically uh, kind of do a, uh, duh, yeah, it's in there. Um, and yet they hadn't disclosed that previously. And then, then the question comes up, who cares? Well, in both Moderna's patents and in prior regulatory guidance from the FDA, and you know, as having worked in this industry, FDA guidance is, is uh, pretty comprehensive and uh, needs to be followed. And, and so for DNA vaccines, uh, there was very clear guidance that you would have to do uh, what's called uh, integration uh, analyses to assess the risk of this kind of contamination. What is integration? It's when these little DNA fragments end up in your genome. Mm. And yes, it can happen. Mm. Uh, it has to do with the nuances of DNA replication and the presence of various enzymes, et cetera. But it absolutely happens. And it's something that's done routinely at the bench by you know first year graduate students in every laboratory, molecular virology laboratory in the world. Uh, is, is, and that's what all this technology is all about is the initial commercial application for these positively charged fats, these lipid nanoparticles, is for getting DNA into cells. Uh, now it's been adapted for putting RNA into cells in animals, uh, but you don't actually have to have that. You can, the RNA will go into the cells even without it. That was a paper that I was second author on in 1990. Um, so, uh, so all of this regulatory guidance says, well, you have to check and prove that the level of contamination with your particular delivery system is not gonna lead to clinically significant uh, mutagenesis or DNA integration events. Uh, right. And um, <clears throat> so uh, it's quite clear now through a series of events, including a directed uh, letter, not too aggressive, from uh, Dr. Joe Latipo, MD, PhD, uh, Harvard, uh, currently the Surgeon General of the State of Florida, to the FDA saying, uh, if you have the data showing that these levels of contaminants are uh, within a safe, are safe, in safe level, uh, please show me the data. Because uh, the uh, research uh, literature indicates that uh, this is potentially toxic, genotoxic. Yep. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to see uh, what proof you have that this level of contamination when delivered with this system, because what we have is the most highly active polynucleotide, DNA and RNA are polynucleotides, most highly active in vivo, that means in, in animals in your body, uh, delivery system uh, for polynucleotides that's ever been invented. Uh, and it works just as well with RNA and DNA. And, and I guarantee that if there is, and we now know there is, this DNA contamination, it will, these formulations will assemble so that they have both RNA and DNA in the little self-assembling particles that are going into your body in the injections. Uh, so uh, Joe wrote the letter and what came back from Peter Marks, who by the way, is one of the two people that created Operation Warp Speed, and is the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation Research, so he has the oversight for the vaccines, was basically a lot of gaslighting uh, and uh, um, gobbledygook, uh, <laughs> miscitations, uh, citing um, a undergraduate textbook as uh, proving that uh, this couldn't possibly happen. That was then amplified by Paul Offit. But in fact, uh, DNA transfection is, you know, uh, it, you can take those two keywords and put them into PubMed and you'll pull up about 40,000 references. Okay? It's, it's, it's routine. So uh, it appears the, the position that the FDA is taking is, well, we have standards for allowable DNA contamination because you always have DNA contamination anytime you're manufacturing a vaccine in a cultured cell or an egg. It's a chronic mm -hmm. problem. I can tell you as a guy that worked in the industry, working on flu vaccines, among other things, DNA contamination is a big problem. Use a Mustang Q column to clean it, uh, and that's still a major problem. But the thing is, that DNA contamination that comes from cell culture or eggs 
is not being wrapped up in little lipid nanoparticles and delivered into your cells. So you can appreciate that if you want to really have an honest answer about the toxicity, you need to use the full drug product, the final drug product as formulated, uh, and you need to test that, but they clearly haven't done it. Uh, and so now the FDA, European Medicines Agency, Health Canada, have rather, I mean, they could have had the approach, uh-oh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't anticipate this. For some reason, we didn't think about it, uh, or maybe we didn't want to think about it. But, uh, yep, mea culpa, it's there. Now we better hold back and not administer these products until we can verify that they're safe at this level of DNA contamination. But instead, what they've decided to do is to propagandize and lie and redirect and uh, character assassinate and the usual stuff. Uh, and that's kind of where we stand right now is okay. the truth is that <laughs> Silver so, doesn't know uh, and we don't have the data. And as you know, in pharma, the rule is not, uh, it's up to uh, the consumer to prove the drug is safe. It's pharma's job and it's right. the regulator's job to prove that the drug is safe. So that's where that stands. I hope that was helpful. It's probably more information than you wanted. <clears throat> Well, I, I the kind of the couple of reasons I was thinking about this is because number one, if if a drug manufacturer doesn't disclose this, and you you said not identified in the label, just for those that are watching, the label is it's that piece of paper that's all wadded up that comes with the medicine and has little teeny little tons and tons and tons of tiny words on it. And if it's, if it's not disclosed in the label, um, and it's considered, you know, especially if it's promoted, it's considered off label promotion. But there's a there's a bigger thing at stake here. The reason why it's there is because I was wondering if it would open the drug manufacturer open to uh, litigation from consumers because of the fact that um, it wasn't fully disclosed to the FDA. And the FDA so could have said, hey, this yeah. doesn't disclose. Does, does this pierce the veil of uh, indemnification? That is the big kahuna here. And right. uh, as you know, Paxton is suing Pfizer in Texas over mm. false advertising uh, okay. for these products. And uh, so uh, state attorney general, state of Texas, and Pfizer is busy scrambling, uh, trying to get it uh, booted out of state court and into federal court and into a more uh, friendly venue uh, yeah, than sure. the state of Texas, uh, usual kind of machinations. And I was just like this morning reviewing the Pfizer uh, response and uh, Pfizer continues to take the position and, and I just want to credit uh, Sacha Latipova is not a fan of mine, uh, but she has accurately identified that, uh, and, and it came out in legal proceedings, uh, I think against Bree Dressen, uh, in her case against Pfizer. I may have that wrong. Uh, <clears throat> that um, Pfizer's position as upheld in the US courts is that essentially, as Sacha paraphrased it, uh, they didn't commit fraud. They delivered the fraud that the government ordered. Remember, I said they're the contractor. And so yeah. in a normal relationship, as you know, within pharma, the responsibility, the final responsibility for the drug product and everything that happens during the clinical trials and everything else flows upward to the sponsor. But if the sponsor is the government, uh, then you've got a problem. Yeah. And uh, that, that, is, that remains Pfizer's position is that uh, under the other transactional authority contracts, which are not normal federal acquisition regulations, they're a, a little bypass that BARDA set up uh, to entice pharma to do business with the government because pharma didn't want to operate under the standard federal acquisition regulations. Uh, and under that, uh, Pfizer had very minimal reporting requirements and uh, they met their milestones and the government continued to pay them for it. And so they assert that uh, they met all the government uh, criteria for disclosure. They didn't commit fraud. Uh, they, they did exactly what the government wanted, which included the lack of uh, rigorous toxicology work, uh, non-clinical testing, et cetera, because that's what the government ordered from them. Uh, and that's, that's the position they're taking in this case of uh, Texas okay. versus Pfizer. Okay. Uh, so that's, so, that's kind of where it stands is they're asserting uh, that they are indemnified by the other transactional authority contract uh, and um, any any liability to the extent that there is liability or there was fraud uh, flows to the government. 
And of course, the, that that is the, the nut that I was mentioning. Somebody's got to take the fall for this. And so yeah. is the government going to allow, and more importantly, the courts, are, are they going to kind of go along with this artifice that uh, uh, a Pfizer uh, only did the minimal things that the government required uh, rather than uh, what would normally be required for a vaccine product? Uh, and that, and that, therefore, the liability vests with the government and not with Pfizer. Or is are the courts going to say, no, 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 you pulled the wool, you pulled the wool over the government's eyes, and uh, that constitutes fraud. What you've done, and uh, that pierces the veil of uh, liability uh, indemnification, and uh, we're Paxton and the others are going to be able to take you to court. And yep. you know, if that if that dam breaks. Uh, you're going to see Pfizer's uh, market cap, which is already in the tank, um, just plummet like a stone because the yep. liability here would be global. We're talking about billions of doses. Yeah, and that's and that's why I brought it up because, um, you know, I and in pharma, the, the cardinal sin of pharma is doing off-label promotion. And even when the vaccines first came out, and I was I was like I was blowing or, my whistle or, or, or promoting an unlicensed drug. Okay, <laughs> well, that too. authorized drug is not a licensed drug. I mean that I, I objected. Do you remember Sesame Street and CNN promoting this product yes. for children? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I objected at the time, and I asked my followers on Twitter uh, to file complaints against the uh, say CNN physician who was doing those promotions because he has multiple medical licenses, and hmm. you know you can have a unlicensed uh, uh, person. Uh, promoting a, a unlicensed medical product, and that's one thing. But to have a, a licensed medical professional uh, promoting off-label or promoting a <clears throat> uh, unlicensed medical product, that's a clear breach of, of federal law as embodied in the legislation that gave rise to uh, medical affairs as a discipline. Uh, it, and, <clears throat> and you're absolutely right. So I have a couple of questions from the audience. I, I want to make sure I get to these. I want to get to them now. I'm going to com combine a couple as well. Um, the, the first two I'm going to combine is more like a more like health related. Um, so I've got uh, I'm going to combine Holly. I see your question and Art Holly. Uh, I also see your question, um, and it has to. They're kind of two. They're kind of the same. One is asking the difference between uh, you know how you compare ivermectin and HCQ. But the other person was asking, okay, what's, if you've had COVID, or I'll even add to this question, if you've had the vaccine, um, is there a particular protocols that you recommend to maybe even clear out spike proteins? Okay, let's take the second one. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to self edit and not name the company. There's actually two companies out there right now that are promoting a nutraceutical product. Uh, so it falls under a different regulatory framework. There was a particular statute enacted that enabled uh, um, nutritional supplements and nutraceuticals as an industry. Uh, I think it was in 93 uh, um, that makes them under slightly different regulations than a full pharmaceutical. You don't have to do clinical trials, but you can't, uh, you can market them, but you can't assert that they have a particular activity or therapeutic benefit unless you do the clinical trials to prove it. So you can sell vitamin C, but if you say that vitamin C cures the common cold in your marketing material, then the FDA is gonna bust your chops. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are two companies that I'm aware of right now that are marketing a natokinase based product. What is natokinase? It's a protease, something that cuts proteins, uh, that is present in a fermented product. It's a Japanese or Chinese, uh, um, fermented product called natto uh, and it is it is a enzyme that's present in this fermentation product so it's a natural product and it it uh, I was one of the first to talk about this I, I learned about it from another physician scientist uh, that presented some data to us uh, this physicians health associate groups that I've been affiliated with and uh, and showed that natto kinase in a test tube has the ability to cleave spike protein which is very resistant to degradation. Uh, so spike hangs around a long time. It's absolutely a toxin. It is very difficult for your body to clear. Normal protein cutting enzymes or proteases have a hard time with it. Natokinase 
uh, is able to cleave uh, spike protein in uh, the test tube. Uh, and natto kinase has some oral bioavailability. So if you take a bunch of it, some of it will end up in your bloodstream. And so based on that, the thesis has been that if you take natto kinase, it will help clear spike protein from your blood uh, in your body. That's, that's a speculative hypothesis at this point. There are no rigorous clinical trials demonstrating this. Uh, and those companies that are marketing it for that purpose, I think, have crossed the, the regulatory line in uh, asserting a uh, labeled, uh, or, you know, they're asserting a therapeutic benefit uh, for a nutraceutical product uh, that isn't supported by clinical trials, and I'm surprised that the FDA hasn't busted their chops already. Uh, but that is a spike formula, part of a key part of a spike formula that is being marketed. I personally take nidokinase. Uh, I'm not advising that you should take it. I did have a post-vaccination syndrome. Uh, my personal post-vaccination syndrome, not advising you. I'm a licensed physician, but I don't give medical advice over the internet. Uh, but uh, my uh, post-vaccination syndrome was greatly relieved by taking ivermectin. So that's just my experience. Uh, and I had a response within 24 hours that uh, was quite striking. My uh, um, stamina in hiking, uh, which is something that I do a fair amount. Um, you know, I work, I, we have a farm here. Uh, I, I'm, I do a lot of physical work uh, and, and I had uh, really my exercise tolerance is way down. Uh, so that's that's my personal story. So I do take natokinase. I did take ivermectin when I was really suffering. And I've had cardiac damage uh, from my uh, second dose of Moderna. Uh, I've disclosed that openly. It's one of the things that people criticize me for. Why did you ever take the jab? Um, and that must prove that you're controlled opposition. Uh, but I took the jab because I had long COVID and it was believed that at the time that that might help by boosting your immune response even more, to help you mm. clear it. Uh, and uh, I had been assured by Peter Marks that the product was safe. I had a direct teleconference with him and I needed to travel internationally, which I absolutely could not have done had I not taken the jab. Uh, so I only took those two doses and on dose number two, I did get one of the bad batches and I did develop uh, a series of what are now seen as classical post-vaccination syndrome effects, uh, hypertension, uh, elevated heart rate, uh, um, uh, various neurologic findings. Of course, uh, I still have the tinnitus, as many of us do, uh, restless leg syndrome, and some other things. Pardon the cough. Uh, so... Uh, that's that's um, my story, and and that was only relieved, really, as I said, when I took ivermectin. So, are there things that can clear it? It it appears that tincture of thyme helps quite a bit. Uh, so be patient. Uh, I I personally had a a final really what finally uh, brought me back to near normal. I'm on beta blockers uh, now. I wasn't before. Never had cardiac problems in the past, uh, as are many uh, now. Uh, but uh, my physician uh, uh, treated me with a modified version of the FLCCT protocol, which includes steroids, ivermectin, and a number of other agents. Uh, so my advice to you, my friend, is find a physician uh, who is not in the narrative, acknowledges that there can be post-vaccination syndrome, and is experienced in treating it. There aren't very many of them, uh, but uh, they are out there. They're often very quiet uh, because they don't want to have their medical licenses uh, pulled. I hope that yeah. helps. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I'm going to ask the last question. Um, uh, Christina Gomez, I wanted to let you know, um, based on your question, I would definitely recommend uh, Dr. Robert Malone's Substack. Um, lots of great information in there. Uh, follow him. He's got 350,000 subscribers already and good helpful information that might help you. But the last question comes from Michaela Emery. This is a little different. This is a young person. And uh, she says, uh, what is your advice for someone in the Gen Z generation who wants to stand up against unjust social experiments, experiments like COVID and the vaccine mandates? 
Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, this this is, uh, if I can paraphrase, it's not just Gen Z, it's all of us. Uh, and I think that we make too much of this generational difference. Uh, and of course, Chad, this is a, a Christian-based network. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, um, you you may recall the questioner, but what was her name again? Uh, the one that just asked? Yeah. Michaela. Michaela. Uh, so Michaela, you may remember or not, when I went on Joe Rogan, I spoke about this thing, mass formation or mass psychosis or mass formation psychosis. And this is this comes out of scholarly work uh, having to do with fundamental psychology of human behavior in groups. And it goes back all the way to Plato, uh, runs through uh, Freud, uh, Hannah Arndt, uh, in her work on the origins of totalitarianism during uh, the era of the Nazis. Uh, she was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and then updated by Dr. Matthias Desma, who's a personal friend who wrote a book called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And uh, um, the Psychological Basis of Totalitarianism is his, his title. Uh, what uh, Matthias teaches, and he's very focused in his new book now uh, on what can we do. What he teaches is that what happened here in large part was the fragmentation of society, uh, the splitting of all of us from each other through social media, through uh, mass media, television, of course, and uh, the cell phone uh, has, has resulted in massive fragmentation of all of us from each other. The social bonds that we need to be healthy as individuals have been uh, rendered asunder. And, and he uses terms like bullshit jobs and, and these kinds of drivers that have separated us all from each other. And then of course that got further accelerated and exacerbated by the shutting down of churches, uh, the prohib prohibition on assembly, which is absolutely contrary to the U.S. Constitution, and these various things. And what happens when you get people fragmented and isolated from each other like that? They naturally want to form some sort of belonging, a group, uh, and they want to form a mass. That's the origin of the term. And uh, what they will do is they'll coalesce around uh, a propaganda line or an item, an individual, a political party, a movement. Uh, and this gives them a sense of belonging. I'm one of these people. I'm part of this group. And they're, part of that became the jab uh, and the masking. So you still see people that basically use masks, even though they're proven not to work. It's kind of a, a demonstration that you're belonging to a group. Yeah. Uh, uh, so not to get too deep into that, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the cure, the way out of the woods is by forming community, building community. And I like to say these three key words that our way out of the woods here is by um, trying to uh, reinvigorate a commitment to integrity, respect for human dignity, and community. Yeah. Uh, so integrity, dignity, community. And Matthias, in his latest work, is focusing on something called truth speech. That in order to reform social bonds between each other, we have to have trust. That's the, the foundational level. Uh, we also really need to have some common ethics and Judeo-Christian ethical system has been uh, the one that most, many of us, let's say in the West uh, or other religious systems have used to provide us with ethical grounding. But it starts with trust. If you wanna build uh, relationships and community, how do you get trust? Well, Matthias makes the point that you get trust by speaking truth that the subterfuge and lying and half-truths that have become so common in the psychological operations that we're surrounded by, the weaponization of information, social media, mass media, et cetera, to control us and to propagate false narratives 
is a big part of the problem. And what you can do, whether you're Gen Z or an old fogey like me, is practice speaking truth from the heart. It's not easy. And in order to do it, you have to kind of open yourself up to people. You have to, you, somebody else won't trust you unless you start by trusting them. So it's this, like a high wire act. You, you have to show trust and faith in the other person in order to receive it. And you communicate that by how you speak. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here, Chad and I, is is really truth speech. We're trying to to speak inconvenient truths uh, honestly and from the heart to the best of our ability. We don't get everything right. And that's what I ask you to do in your life. And don't be aggressive about it. Don't don't you know, you have to do it with empathy. You can't walk up to the poor soul that's wearing a mask in line. <laughs> Uh, at the grocery store and say, boy, you're a jerk. Don't you know the data? Uh, that's not going to get anywhere. Uh, you got to do it with an open heart and with empathy and sometimes enormous amounts of patience, including with your parents or your uncles or whomever else you're encountering that are, are wrapped up in this. It's really hypnosis, this psi war that has been deployed on everybody. And uh, you can kind of feel sorry for him a little bit. Uh, if if you're somebody that hasn't, it's been resistant to this, and you haven't fallen victim to the promoted narrative, good on you. But not everybody is strong. Not everybody has been able to avoid it. Uh, and um, so that's what you can do: is uh, try to be honest, act with integrity, respect human dignity, build community, and speak truth to the best of your ability. How's that? Thank you, Dr. Malone. And, I, and it's funny because here we are at the Nexus Mountain Network, and this is what we're doing. We are building community, but I want to tell the audience the, the lion behind you. I asked you before the show, and I asked you what it represented, and uh, this is neat. It's a perfect tie-in, and I'm paraphrasing because I didn't have a chance to look it up, but um, he said it represented St. Augustine, and it was a phrase that he gave, and I, I, it's not a direct quote. I'm paraphrasing, but the phrase was, the truth is like a lion. Set it free, and it will defend itself. Yeah, and uh, truth is like a lion. Money. You don't you don't have to defend it. Set it free; it will defend itself. And and uh, that is absolutely uh, considered a quote from him. Uh, and I think we've all benefited from it. Yeah. And of course, the the lion. Uh, many of my followers refer to it as the truth lion, but the lion has multiple layers of meaning for those of you that are Christians, as you know, uh, the Lion of Judah and and uh, many other things. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, that's that's why it's there in the background is uh, kind of as a physical manifestation of a commitment to to truth and just speaking truth and letting it defend itself. Amen. So, Dr. Malone, thank you so much. I'm going to let the audience go. And I have one last question I'm going to ask you offline if you could stand for just one more second. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for coming on, Dr. Malone. Thanks for participating and having me.